Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of the Sunday Matinee with my hair in my eye. This is all about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, except for the first part, which is going to be about the news. But tonight I have with me uh, Andrea Gordon. And I have, I have an Avengers shirt on. <laughs> and returning from episode one, who will be joining us by audio only tonight due to technical difficulties is Dea Osborne. Imagine I am waving. See me waving back. Uh, I am also wearing a themed shirt. Uh, if you, uh, if you know me at all, that's not a surprise what, I, what that is. So uh, we're going to start with the news. Uh, I just want to do a brief update on uh, cinemas reopening on, with a little pandemic we have going on here. So um, a lot of outlets are reporting that uh, the film Unhinged starring Russell Crowe, which was, I was shocked, there was a new release this week in movie theaters. Uh, it opened to $4 million, which doesn't sound like much, but all things considered, um, they're pretty happy about it. Uh, most, uh, most of the showings have been in drive-ins, uh, especially in states like California and most of Washington where you cannot go to a traditional cinema. Um, so, and they're, they're looking to open more next week, which kind of has me a little worried. I'm, you know, I've said it a bunch, I miss movies, but this is, n I just don't think this is the right time to be opening cinemas. Uh, considering uh, the number of schools that have tried to open and do in-person stuff and have like shut down after a week because people are getting sick. So that, that is pretty much the news. There was no really relevant MCU news, which is a shame, but uh, we'll, we'll just get started with the big stuff here. All right. So gosh, the Marvel cinematic universe, uh, we're we're all here today because we love it. Um, we have uh, gone to the theater multiple times to see some of these movies. Um, I I saw uh, Infinity War eleven times in the theater because I had nothing to do that summer. Um. So, but you know, people always say that the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, is doing something that no one's ever done before, uh, which to a degree is true. But I wanted to, before we like start talking about favorite stuff here, like point out like there, there, this, there is a precedent for what has happened here. Um, in 1943, uh, two, year, two or three years after Universal released the original Wolfman, uh, they decided it would be in their best interest to, in order to keep their respective monster franchises going, start pitting the monsters against each other. And that is how we got Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. And then every film in those respective series after that included... Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and Dracula all, I won't say fighting each other, um, but, you know, they, they all ended up in the same stories together. Um, now, it was cool, but when you look back on it, uh, it's clear that they were not um, planning with any of these films at all. Uh, you know, and there were, only, there were really only three or four in which there were, like, multiple characters meeting up and fighting each other. So... You know, it was cool at the time, uh, but, you know, again, they didn't plan on this. This was also, these were also considered B-movies. They tried to film them on as minimal a budget as possible, which if you're Marvel, um, you're trying to film it on the biggest budget you possibly can conceive. Um, but 20, about 20 years later, um, over in Japan, Godzilla was becoming a big thing. Godzilla fought King Kong, and then Toho Studios decided from then on out, uh, Godzilla needs to start fighting other monsters that we have created. And so in 1964, uh, Godzilla versus Mothra came out, and it was the first instance where uh, two monsters in that sort of studio universe fought each other. And then you have Ghidra, the three-headed monster, where monsters team up to fight one and destroy all monsters, where literally it's, it's, it's their Avengers. There's like 12 monsters in there. Um, but again, they didn't plan these things out too far in advance. Um, and the budgets kept getting smaller and smaller um, because these films, uh, these films were hit hard by the rise of television and the rise of American studios doing science fiction films with far bigger budgets and more effective special effects. Um, 
so it kind of the sort of idea of a cinematic universe kind of died out for a long long time until uh, a really really bad movie came out called alien versus predator which i love it it's terrible um was teased way back in predator 2 when like danny glover shows up on the predator ship at the end and you see the alien skull and you're like oh my god these characters exist in the same universe and it was like 15 years later that it finally happened after several years of comic books and stuff too that was a thing um but there were only two of those um but like that was kind of that and i think freddy versus jason is like the only other instance like before marvel really uh that this was a big thing i mean andrea dea can you think of any other big franchises that attempted something of this nature uh before marvel did we're going to talk about dc in a second I think it depends on how you qualify it because everything from Star Wars, the Lord of Rings trilogy, Back to the Future, I remember seeing number two in the theater and it very distinctly saying, we will return on the back. So they already knew there was going to be a three. So I think figuring out what the qualifier is for that, um, having a universe, so to speak, it doesn't have a whole universe. There definitely were multiple movies already kind of pre-planned. In a go that did forward the story further in the first kind of Jurassic Park series, I think. <laughs> um, the Burton Batman kind of deal. Um, so not not nearly as vast, um, but I think everything kind of rode on Downey Jr. being able to to pull off Iron Man to begin with before they'd even know they'd have an opportunity to do that. So I don't know how far they were in it before they were knowing this is a possibility and we're going to be able to do this and plan for the long haul. Well, I mean, obviously they had some kind of long distance plan in place because they teased the Avengers movie at the end of Iron Man 1. But yeah, I mean, there's really no way to know um, exactly how far they had planned and who they had planned on bringing in you know, apart from maybe two or three years in advance. Um. My, mine was, um, I mean, it kind of happened before Marvel, but then it like expanded on and that was the Harry Potter movies. Um, mm -hmm. I know they're based on books, but I mean, so are the Marvel movies, let's be real. Um, but because I think that they had the same actors throughout. I mean, we literally grew up with these kids. And so all the seven movies came out and then they wanted to expand to make it the wizarding world. So now we have the Fantastic Beasts movie coming out and there's like an entire land at Universal Studios. So I think maybe that is kind of its, its own thing, but um, I mean, th there's no Harry Potter versus Dracula or whatever, as cool as that would be. But I mean, it's kind of its own little uh, extended universe and, and it's because the wizarding world uh, the Fantastic Beasts movies and the Harry Potter movies are two different movies, but it's obviously in the same universe, even though Fantastic Beasts is a prequel, but it came after. That's that's my intake on it. Yeah, that's actually a good one. I wouldn't have thought about that, but yeah, because there's only like the, what, the one Fantastic Beast book. Um, I mean, there's yeah. also... Um, yeah. uh, there's also... Uh, not so much, I think, a cinematic universe, but uh, one thing that Marvel pulled for another franchise was uh, James Bond. Um, at the end of every James movie, they'll say, this is the end, but James Bond will return in the next movie. And I think it was starting with, uh, it was either, I think it was starting with either Iron Man 2 or with Thor. At the end of the credits, they would say, you know, Iron Man will return in the Avengers, or Thor will return. And it was, and I, I think that's really nice. It's also, it was a good reassurance to know that, uh, they hadn't given up on specific characters just yet. <laughs> Not quite. No. And uh, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings also, I guess, could qualify because they did do the whole movie series and then go back and do The Hobbit separately. No, they didn't. They didn't? They didn't do The Hobbit. I, I just, I don't like to acknowledge that The Hobbit exists. Oh, it never happened. Sorry. It never, it never hey, happened in my, in my... What about, what about the Rankin Bass one? Oh, that one's wonderful. I love that. Yeah, that that is the Hobbit in my head canon. Um, <laughs> nothing against like every actor 
who was in that movie. Every actor in that in those in that trilogy is amazing. But uh, I just, I don't know. It should have just been one movie. Oh yeah, no, I totally agree on that. Um, I don't know. I, don't, I think I heard. I think I heard Daya say this, but Jurassic Park. Yeah, um, the first series set. Yeah, in Jurassic World, t- it's still technically a part of Jurassic Park because Jurassic Park exists in Jurassic World, so it's all one universe. Whether you like the Jurassic World movies or not, they are part of the Jurassic Park universe. Oh, so the Pratt's do cross over. They're all using the same. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. I haven't they, seen those ones. They mention they mention uh, Richard Attenborough's character in the ah, movie, okay. and they have they have the the cars left over from the park and yep. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Goldblum is in uh, the second Jurassic World, uh, Fallen yes, Kingdom, he is. and uh, the next one I think it's called Dominion is going to be basically the Avengers of the Jurassic, you know, Park World movies. I guess everyone who didn't get eaten is coming back. So. <laughs> Nice. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, who knows? They may res- resurrect some dead characters. They, I won't go into the whole why the hell did they bring back Ian Malcolm. Of course, that's a book problem, not a movie problem. But I digress. See, we're going on tangents already. Um, so, yeah. Th- so there was definitely, you know, a sort of precedent for what Marvel was doing. They just did it in a bigger, more incredible way than anyone ever has. And since they started it, um, a lot of studios have tried to emulate that sort of formula. Uh, the ones that I was looking at were, uh, I'll actually talk about DC last because of all the DC news that came out from yesterday. Um, it actually has me a little more excited about what they have in store for us. Um, so Universal Studios tried to kind of resurrect their classic monsters and do a sort of MonsterVerse thing, uh, starting with uh, the 2017 remake of The Mummy starring Tom Cruise, which I didn't see. I've mentioned this before on the show. I haven't seen it. And it's it's going to take some alcohol or something for me to do that because it looked terrible and it got terrible reviews and it bombed at the cinema, at the box office. So I, th- I think they immediately decided to abandon ship on that whole crossover. Um, another one that's not holding up too well, which makes me very sad is... Uh, Warner Brothers, they're calling it the Monsterverse. They should call it the Kaijuverse because it's Godzilla. Um, you know, it's it's a series that's sort of had diminishing returns at the box office here at the States. The first Godzilla, 2014, did pretty well at the box office. Then there was Kong Skull Island, which I don't think enough people knew was in the same universe. And I think it, I think it also did moderately well. But last year, uh, King of the Monsters, which finally brought a bunch of monsters into the fold, uh, it tanked pretty bad. Um, I think just about every, there were a lot, that that was also a, a bad summer for a lot of movies in the wake of Endgame. Uh, I think a lot of people just wanted to see Endgame again that summer. Um, and uh, it's going it, to, for them, Godzilla versus Kong, which is supposed to come out in March, uh, it has to do well, or this, their series is, is going to be dead. Um We'll talk about DC again in a second. Do, again, Andrea and Dea, do you, can you think of any other franchises that have tried to do this since Marvel? Um, I mean, actually, technically, Harry Potter kind of did because Fantastic Beasts only started a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, Harry Potter, I guess, counts as one that sort of tried to join that uh, trend. I mean, besides the obvious DC, but we're going to talk about that later. (laughs) I actually, I thought of one and it just left my mind and I'm really mad about it. And now I have to think for like a hot second. Well, if it it comes to your brain, speak out, let us know. Like I said, this is not, we don't have to go exactly by the script here. Um, I mean, it's still, I know, I hate grouping it together because it's the same company. It's all Disney, but Star Wars. Uh, yeah, they've definitely tried to, uh, I mean, Star Wars was always sort of its own universe, but they definitely have tried to follow the trend of trying to get out at least one movie per year. Yeah, now, uh, and now they have a TV show. Well, they have always yeah. had a TV show with the Clone Wars, but The Mandalorian now. 
their first live action show yeah so yeah i mean uh i I think it's a shame that uh that we're not getting going to see more uh solo i enjoyed solo i did too i i I thought it was a fun movie um so i'm I'm really sad that we're not going to see more of that part of the universe for a while but the mandalorian was great it was a great to see that side of star wars and not have to deal with the Force and the Skywalkers. Um, I'm really excited for some of the unannounced Star Wars films they have coming up down the road. Um, I think I think Taika Waititi is attached to one of them, which is really good news because, um, you know, he's he's been on a roll of late ever since Thor. Um, so I yeah, not, I, yeah, I, I know it's not a universe, but I mean, you could argue it is. But the Leica movies. Because they all they all yeah. reference they're self referential and they do callbacks to like their other movies that they've done because and they theoretically could all exist in the same universe. That's true, yeah. Um, and th- and those are fun movies. If you haven't been yeah. keeping an eye on those movies, please do yourself a favor and watch them. Uh, that's uh, Coraline, Paranorman, Box Trolls. Kubo, Kubo. was next, right? And then well, missing, missing, link. Missing, missing Link. Yeah, they're all. Um, I've actually haven't seen Missing Link, but the others are very good. Um, actually, it, in that regard, Pixar, the Pixar universe is kind of that same way. That they're very self-referential, and you can almost always spot a Pixar Easter egg in one of their movies. You know, I a one thirteen. Something's going to pop up there. um i just had something and now it's gone ah yeah see see it happens Uh, yep that's what happens when we try that's what happens when we try to improvise um well since we're let's just jump to dc um you know they tried they tried and in my humble opinion so far with a handful of exceptions have failed um I, I'm one of those people who did not like Man of Steel, did not like Batman versus Superman, did not like Suicide Squad, really did not like Justice League. Um, but Wonder Woman is amazing. Yes. Aquaman was a ton of fun. Uh, what other ones? I've got some of them over here. Oh, uh, Shazam. I loved Shazam. That was a lot of fun. Um, I'm, not, I'm not too keen on uh, the Joker movie. Um, I think it's a little bit overrated, but it also kind of doesn't really fit into that universe. Um, oh, and, uh, and Birds of Prey. I loved Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey and Wonder Woman, I think, are probably the two best movies they have done so far. Uh, but yesterday at DC Fandom, they announced a handful of films, including uh, they talked about Flash and how they're going to adapt the Flashpoint storyline. And they're going to bring back out of retirement, both Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton to both play mm. Batman, which is incredible, incredible news. Like the, the, the only way they could possibly make this better. Um, and you know, it, it, it gets me sad thinking about this is if there was a way to bring back Christopher Reeve and get Superman, like his Superman in there. What about Adam West, Batman? Adam West also, uh, yeah, that hurts. <laughs> um, uh, I they may be able to get Burt Ward. That'd be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that was cool. And uh, the Wonder Woman 1984 trailer, we've already, we talked about this before we started recording. Um, amazing, great trailer. Looks really fun. Uh, the Batman trailer, um, like, oof, oof. They love, they love making that character super dark and hopefully it works. My fingers are crossed because uh, I loved Robert Pattinson in The Lighthouse. Uh, so I, I think you really... see that. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah I haven't I seen it either. It's really okay. weird. It is really <laughs> weird and I love it so much. Um, what else? Oh, they, they teased Black Adam, which is sort of, the an, sort of an antagonistic character for Shazam. Uh, they announced Shazam 2. Uh, I believe they're calling it Fury of the Gods. Uh, gosh, there was something else they announced. The Suicide Squad. Oh, yeah. And they, they showed behind the scenes of Suicide Squad. 
And they also showed a, a little montage of all the characters and who's playing them. And it looks really, uh, you know, James Gunn's directing it. And, and if you thought Guardians was good, um, suit, the new Suicide Squad is probably up your alley. It looks really dorky. Um, Margot Robbie is still going to be Harley Quinn. So don't worry about that. Yes. That's all I care. That is yeah, all Yeah, she's still Harley I Quinn. <laughs> okay. uh, it's Harley Quinn and Joel Kahneman is coming back to be Rick Flagg and Viola Jai Davis. Courtney. And Viola Davis for Amanda Waller Ooh, and Jai yeah. Courtney as Captain Boomerang is coming back. But those are the only, those I believe are the only ones coming back. Um, which is fine. A lot of those other characters weren't that interesting. <laughs> um, Joker. Is there going to be a Joker? We no, don't know. no Joker. Well, yeah, we don't, we don't know. I, we don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Only because I think, um, I think since, since Joaquin took over the role in, in that standalone film, they kind of want to make us all forget that, that, uh, He's that, a part of the squad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if um, there is, I feel like it'll be teased in the Batman rather than the Suicide Squad. But the Batman That's a thought. is... I don't know. I have no idea. Unfortunately, the Batman, it's, uh, they've already announced, is going to be uh, separate, like the Joker movie is. So it's not going to tie back into... I mean, they're calling it a multiverse movie. So they could tie it back in some way in the future with Flash or any other multiverse style character. But right now it sounds like it's going to be a standalone deal. So I was going to ask the both of you, uh, what, what is it um, about DC that they couldn't do that Marvel's doing right? But uh, after yesterday with all these announcements, um, I think they're starting to do the right thing, uh, which is sort of tease what it is they're doing. Because they, They've spent a lot of time just saying, this is the one movie we have coming out next year. Mm-hmm. And then waiting and waiting and waiting. And then, you know, then announcing the next one movie. Um, it's, it's cool to know that Marvel had this big grand plan. We just never felt like DC had a big grand plan. Um, and I, so what, what is it about now then that, may, that has made them decide it's time for a big grand plan? Is it possibly think- because, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I think because Zack Snyder was directing everything and then he finally gave the, gave it to Patty Jenkins and, you know, everyone else. So having a different director per movie, just like Marvel did, I think really helped it. That's my. That's, that's a good point. It, you know, it, they were, by the time they got to Justice League, uh, only Patty Jenkins and David Iyer had directed any other films for Marvel, and one was Suicide Squad. And again, I try to forget that movie. Mm-hmm. But Patty but Jenkins, was, though. But Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was so good. Wonder Woman, when it was released, and I, you know, I st- still probably is the best one. I, I, again, I still really, I really like the Birds of Prey movie. I think it's a lot of fun. But th- those are the two, um, both directed by women as well. So, you know, it, uh, also, DC on, was, women. yeah, DC, <laughs> as, as much as I like to give, give crap to DC, they were the first ones to finally give uh, a female character their own movie. And I believe they were the first to have a female director. They almost had, Patty Jenkins almost directed Thor The Dark World. She would have been, never mind. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna get we're gonna get to Thor: uh-huh. The Dark World. It's gonna it's gonna happen. Uh, we have talked so much. We need to really start getting into the actual Marvel of it all. Um, so, yeah, some have tried, some have failed. DC looks like you're getting on track. I hope they do because they've got a ton of amazing characters in their stories, and some great stories too. So and their their big flaw is having really really good trailers for really crappy movies. Also. Yes. I love the trailer for Justice League, but I did not love Justice League. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and yesterday, I, I should have talked about this. Uh, it, it was announced that uh, the Snyder Cut of the Justice League is coming. Um, it's coming exclusively to HBO Max, which is a bummer because if any of you watched last week's episode, you'll know about how I don't want to get into new streaming services, and that's one I don't have. Um, what's kind of like intimidating about this movie is it's going to be four hours long four one hour episodes comprising the justice league movie, which is insane to me to think that they, and they're not doing reshoots. They just had that much footage that got cut. 
which yeah I, it's, and it's crazy to think that like man it, it i i have a hard time thinking that Zack snyder can make a better movie than joss whedon did but you know yeah without that, that's, that's my problem. <laughs> but 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 you know when joss whedon came over and took over the justice league he clearly didn't save it <laughs> so he did not he did not and so that's and that was a weird thing for me because I thought oh this is gonna because I too was bored with their DC universe outside of Wonder Woman and so it was like oh okay they're they're gonna get a writer in there they're gonna get a comedian in there they're gonna get a person who's going to put some more women focus they're going to this is the notorious um weed and way of doing things and I thought oh that's gonna help it significantly and it just didn't or maybe it did maybe this is just going to be four hours of boring we don't know hard to say we don't um i i posted on my personal facebook page last night i hope it's good because it and it has to be because warner brothers does not need a four-hour train wreck on their hands they Enough already have those. yeah <laughs> they are they already have a you know nine-hour train wreck with the hobbit trilogy I'm sorry for anyone out there who actually likes the Hobbit trilogy. I know you exist, but you know, that's a debate for another time. On to the real meat of this, the actual Marvel Cinematic Universe. The series that in, has the most incredible momentum of any, any series um, ever. Uh, 23 films so far, not counting films that have yet to be released in just 11 years. That's an average of more than two films a year. Uh, no other series has done that. Even series that have hit the 20 plus film mark. Uh, James Bond is on 25 films. Well, 24, 25 if we ever get to see No Time to Die. Um, but it took them the better, it took them over 50 years to get there. It took Godzilla, uh, you know, 60, almost seven, we're almost to 70 years on Godzilla to get to 30 films. Uh, you know, uh, and it, it's, I know it's all because uh, you've already had that established in the comic books, the sort of crossover style of universe. Um, and it, it helps that you can film three films at a time with different actors doing different things. Um, I, imagine, uh, I imagine if Daniel Craig had to make three James Bond movies in a year and get all three of them out, uh, he he would be absolutely exhausted. Um, so yeah, I mean, what, like the, this, is, that, this is what DC should be aspiring to, is getting to that point where they can get two to three films out every year and start getting more interconnected stuff. Um, but we, we've had this momentum going for 11 straight years with very few stops in between. Now we have had a stop. We were supposed to get Black Widow in May, uh, now we are supposed to be getting it on the current release date is November 6th. So how, how much do you think that delay is going to sort of affect the momentum? And, you know, if it gets delayed even more, how badly is that going to affect their momentum? It's hard to say. Um, I think um, Disney's kind of confused um, let's face it, it's Disney. I know it's Marvel, but Disney owns Marvel. But um, they're because they're they're releasing Mulan on Disney Plus for premium subscribers. So for an extra price, you can watch Mulan. But they're not doing that with Black Widow, which makes me think they want people to experience it in the cinema. But if the cinemas never open or these COVID cases keep going up, which they will, um, they're never going to get that chance to. Now, my positive is that the last movie we got was well far from home spider-man far from home but avengers endgame can you imagine if this had hit after infinity war and we didn't get to see endgame for we, several uh, years <laughs> we, we talked about this actually on last week's episode about streaming services and we we came to the conclusion that if it had been endgame that had been delayed they would have to put it on disney plus because yeah. it's it's on it's it's just unfair to make people wait that long for the conclusion of 10 years worth of buildup. Yeah. And, um, and Black Widow is technically a prequel because I mean, spoiler alert, we know what happens to her in Endgame, but 
So we, we get to see her before she joined the Avengers and all that stuff. So I think there's less of an emergency to get that one out because we already know who Black Widow is. That's my that's my theory. But spoiler alert: it actually is. Uh, it's after she joins the Avengers. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, it's. I think. But, it's but I mean, like place. before, yeah. before all it's before. It's, before Civil War, or after Civil War. It's after Civil War. After Civil War, yeah. It's between Civil War and Endgame. Which, you know, I, I didn't think that was where they were going to place it when I, I thought when it was going to be Budapest. It. I thought it was going to be about Budapest. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I thought it was going to be like before Iron Man 2 and then maybe it ends with, you know, Nick Fury saying, I have a new assignment for you. Oh, they, uh, there's also, there's, there, was, there were lots of rumors going around for a while that uh, Robert Downey Jr. was going to make a cameo in it. And it's like, that would make sense then if it was before Iron Man 2. But, you know, this... You know, their writers are, have been spot on every time. So wherever they, wherever they said it, it's going to be fine. Yeah, but, like, but I just think because we, we already know who Black Widow is as a character because she was introduced early mm. on, which is why I feel like Disney's not really in a hurry to get this one out as much as they were with Mulan. The only problem, the only problem is... Oh, sorry, Dea, go ahead. Oh, uh, I think they're going to save it on purpose. They want something that's big and celebratory that's going to bring everybody back together again. I think they want to hold on until they can, we can come back home. We can come back home to our characters, home to our theaters, home to life as they quote unquote used to be. And I'm betting that now that they're finished with the first two kind of movements with the culmination of that end game, um, that they still have plenty to do digitally. They have plenty of effects they can be working on. There's plenty of things that they can have ready for the pipelines and they can start releasing them closer together um, if they need to. Uh, but I'm betting that's what they're holding it for. And, yeah, I think it's going to be a movie that we're going to want to see on the big screen and not yeah. on a little streaming service device. Absolutely. Um, I, think the, uh, I think the movie that is going to sort of showcase just how much audiences are ready to go see a big blockbuster right now um, is Tenet, which comes out on the September 3rd. Um, if no one goes to see Tenet, then that's the sign right there that, um, you know, Black Widow needs to move into 2021 instead of November, um, depending on how, just how bad it is at the end of the year. Um, Tenet did not get great reviews in The Guardian, unfortunately. So we'll see what happens when it gets over here. <laughs> um, my biggest concern with just the momentum stopping now is less on Black Widow and more on the films that they have down the pipeline that maybe they haven't started filming yet. Um, like Thor, Love and Thunder or Dr. Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Oh yeah. I want I, to see the Eternals. <laughs> that um, I believe according to IMDB, I believe that is they have done, they're finished with production and they're just on post-production. So they're probably doing visual effects on that. So that one will probably be ready to go sometime in 2021. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all these ones that have just haven't started filming. Um, I'm especially, you know, hoping they are able to get to Spider-Man three before, um, before Tom Holland ages out of the role. <laughs> well, he'll never age out. He'll always look 14. <laughs> um, In his contract. <laughs> so, so yeah, here, here's hoping fingers crossed, um, you know, if it comes to it, I really, I wouldn't mind Black Widow on Disney Plus for a premium if it really comes down to it. But it's, it is one of those movies that, it's one of the first movies I want to see when I go back to the theater. Yeah. Oh, uh, and I thought of my other multiverse thing. We were way back when we were talking about multiverses that aren't Marvel. <laughs> I wanted to say it before I forget it. Is that okay? Track. Yes. Okay. The M. Night Shyamalan with Glass and Unbreakable. Oh! Nice. That's right. <laughs> and I was like, I know it was a good one, too. And I'm so it glad is. <laughs> it is. Yeah, oh Unbreakable my is the first one, and then Glass is the last one, like 20 years later. That's right. Uh, uh, yeah, and Split. Yeah, Split was the second one. Yeah, yeah, Split. Yeah, sorry. But Gla Unbreakable, Split, and Glass. For the record, I didn't like Glass. I, I would. Well, Unbreakable and Split are both really good. So, 
two for three is not bad. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to talk Sorry, about... Thank you for letting me say that. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, our favorite MCU films. Um, I actually asked uh, people on Facebook and Twitter what their favorites were. And uh, not a long list. A lot of people got, I got repeat answers on this. We got, um, and not everyone said this one's particularly their favorite. Some people would say, this is my favorite. This one's technically the best. And I like this one because blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to mention all the ones that got mentions. So uh, Thor Ragnarok was mentioned four times. Yeah. Winter Soldier was mentioned twice. Mm -hmm. Black Panther was mentioned twice. Spider-Man Homecoming was mentioned once. The original Iron Man was mentioned three times. Mm -hmm. Guardians Volume 2 was mentioned once. Civil War, I'm surprised this one didn't get more, was mentioned only once. Uh, Far From Home got a mention, as well as Captain America, the first Avenger. Um, so Ragnarok is very popular among the, uh, the social media crowd. And rightfully so. It is a very fun film. It's probably, uh, it's probably one of my favorites. Um, what, let's ask first, what are your favorite films from phase one? Avengers, does that count? Yeah. Avengers, I mean, that, they're all coming together for the first time. I just thought, the first time I saw it, it was like, this is so cool. I love it. <laughs> and of course, Captain America, because I mean, it's gonna sound shallow, but I mean, Chris Evans, <laughs> for me it's, it's cat for sure i loved ragnarok because the sense of humor just it it totally allowed thor to open up more um the first avengers i loved as well in guardians i had no idea who the hell they were what was going on going in and i laughed so much and the music was amazing um he cast so well his He's got a fantastic tone quality and just, it's, it's great. And it's bouncing all over the place. Like I should have been lost as hell um, trying to follow that movie because you're just here and you're there. And I, I don't know what any of that means because I don't read the comics and it's still all brought together and emotional and it's great. So we're doing more than phase one. Just go for it. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, I like, I like Ant-Man a lot. Um I can really, I really wish Edgar Wright got to direct it like he was supposed yeah. to, because I could see some Edgar Wright stuff that was in it, like when Luis is telling his story, that's like the best part of the whole movie. Um, I like Guardians of the Galaxy as well, and Thor Ragnarok, and um, um, what's the other one that I like? Oh, Spider-Man, all the Spider-Man movies, <laughs> for reasons that Ben knows. <laughs> All, all of all of the incarnations of them in all of time, or just Tom? The Tom Holland ones from okay. the MCU. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I like Captain Marvel. This is an this is an interesting interesting story. May I go off on a tangent about Captain Marvel? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so the first time I saw Captain Marvel, I was comparing it to Wonder Woman because I think Wonder Woman came out either earlier that year or the year before. Um, and I was like, oh, I I actually liked Wonder Woman better because it's pretty much both these indestructible women kicking ass, which is awesome. Um, so I, the first time I saw Captain Marvel, I thought it was okay. Um, I was like, I, again, I liked Wonder Woman better, but watching it a second time at home on Disney Plus, I was like, wow, I actually really like this movie because now I see how it fits in with the rest of the timeline. And I don't know, watching Brie Larson have a really, really fun time with the role. So I think if you're not a fan of Captain Marvel, um, watch it again and try to watch it with more of an open mind because you won't, they're not, Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel are not the same movie after a second viewing. <laughs> um, and now I really, really love Captain Marvel. Um, and I just thought, I can't wait for the second one. And I really wish she had more to do in Endgame, but that's, I know that was production mm -hmm. reasons that she couldn't, but. Um, my, my second viewing of Captain Marvel, I enjoyed it a lot more than my first viewing, and now I watch it all the time. So <laughs> that's just my little mini tangent. That had nothing to do with anything. Uh, that has everything to do with what we're talking about, actually. <laughs> so we're talking about Marvel. Um, I didn't get the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, my, my favorites, I'll, I'll go from phase one to three, sort of a weird order-ish type thing. Um, uh, my, the first one I 
really, really fell in love with was uh, actually Captain America First Avenger. Um, and it's still one of my favorites because, uh, you know, it's a period piece. They really haven't done anything like it since. It's very unique um, in, in a storytelling sense. Um, and also just as a fan of like Indiana Jones and the World War II kind of setting, um, you know, it, it hits all those right notes for me. Um, Steve Rogers was the first uh, character that I really, really connected to. It, of course, is really hard to connect to Tony Stark because I am not rich. Um, and with Thor, because I cannot, I, I am not worthy. I know this. Um, <laughs> I cannot pick up the hammer. Uh, so yeah, Steve Rogers was just a wonderful character. And yeah, Avengers is also another one of my favorites from phase one. Because again, yeah, what you said, Andrea, just seeing them all come together for the first time uh, was just such a joy. Um, seeing them go from that scene early on in the film where uh, Iron Man fights Thor um, and Cap comes in and has to break him up. Um, actually, to see, to seeing them fight each other anytime is a joy, um, which is why we'll get to why Civil War is one of my favorites. Um, phase two, um, it's going to be Winter Soldier and Guardians. Uh, Winter Soldier did everything right to shake up the universe, and it needed to. Um, and Guardians opened up the biggest can of worms. <laughs> Um, without without Guardians, and yeah, the, it's the music, it's the cast, it's the visuals, it's the directing. And without Guardians, um, I don't think we would have had Ragnarok. Um, at least not not Taika Waititi's vision of Ragnarok. We would have had something that was probably closer to the Dark World, which is... No. Um, and we get, to, we get to Phase 3, and Phase 3, I think, has so many, so many good films. I think it's easily the best phase um civil war i love just because i love all the captain america movies i'm a sucker for him um i I love seeing them all fighting each other um i love you know this is this is a little bit biased coming up but uh dr strange for what reasons reasons that both andrea and dea (laughs) and anyone other of my friends know um gosh what else um, but I think, I think after Dr. Strange, I have to jump all the way to Ragnarok. Um, we've just talked about it enough already. It's, it's a, it's an amazing, wonderful film. I'm glad Taika Waititi is coming back for Love and Thunder. Uh, and you know, obviously Infinity War and Endgame, mm-hmm. like 10 years, two films that really, <laughs> really brought everything to a ridiculously amazing close. Um, so I, I, I think we've already touched a little bit on this, but what are your favorite characters or character arcs throughout the series? Tony Stark, by far, best character arc. Ooh, really? Well, not by far, but <laughs> in the first movie, he's a douchebag. I mean, he's still kind of a douchebag throughout the whole series, but he's a nicer douchebag. But, it's, I mean, he's rich, so we don't know what that's like, but... The first movie, he was like just kind of an a-hole. And then as the movies got more bigger and grander scale, he got, he, he pretty much had a family. I mean, a literal family and his Avengers family that he would die to protect. Whereas in the first movie, he's like, oh, well, oh, well. But I mean, he lost everybody in Infinity War. And by the time Endgame rolled around, I mean, I was crying. But I think he had quite the character arc throughout all the movies. He did. I was really happy that Captain got his full his full circle by the end of Endgame. That really pleased me. That would have gutted me if, if that had not been um, closed, bookended on that. And I loved Tony versus Cap and Cap versus Tony, however you want to do it. Just the, the two challenging, the father he never had or knew he wanted or it was it was an interesting father son situation the the fight that they had um, between each other going all the way through this series um, even the political flip that ended up happening in in civil war and I I really think a huge part of building out that Iron Man was the challenge of Cap saying you can be better um, you can do better I believe in you and other people do too and you have to do better um, and it's not about 
spending more money and building bigger toys and bigger guns. It's about who you are inside. And I really love that, that folding of relationship between them. I, I love that. Nice. Uh, yeah. I love that. Uh, I love that in civil war, while Tony and Steve are starting to break apart, you know, Tony comes across basically, you know, he comes across Peter and he sees in Peter mini Steve Rogers, you know, mm-hmm. this, this kid with these wonderful ideals, uh, you know, with this great sense of what's right and what's wrong. And, uh, you know, he's lost Steve. And so he can, he can take Peter and hopefully make him, you know, the next, the next leader. Um, my, my favorite arc is, uh, is Steve, um, Steve Rogers, just, you know, from the beginning, a soldier who believes, um, you know, that he believes in a specific hierarchy and that, you know, that hierarchy is, is correct. And jumping into the Winter Soldier, realizing that, you know, it's not always right. Um, sometimes you do have to trust your own instincts and say that this is wrong mm-hmm. and breaking with that hierarchy that, you know, he's, you know, he's the soldier. Now, now he's the fugitive. And by the time we get to Civil War, it's not just the hierarchy that he has to break with. It is his friends that he has to break with. Um, and that's even harder and then to have to make up with them later and say to have both Tony and Steve to come together again in end game. It took them all the way to end game to get back together yep. and admit to each other. Okay. We did this wrong. We never should have, you know, we should have gone about this a different way. Cause uh, you know, uh, infinity war would have been a completely different movie if civil war hadn't happened. Um, if they had all been there, Either, either all gone to space together or all stayed on Earth to defend Wakanda together and to, st- and to protect Vision. If they had all been there, they could have done it. You know, honestly, just, be- just between uh, Scarlet Witch and Doctor Strange and Tony, who all three in that film went one-on-one. Captain and- Marvel. In-, in Endgame, yes. I'm still in Infinity <laughs> okay, War. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I guess yeah, and Steve did too. Like they all, they all literally go one on one on against Thanos and don't die, which is incredible considering like what he does to Hulk at the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Steve. Um, and actually, um, not not his complete character arc, but I love Thor's character arc between say Ragnarok, and, <laughs> between Ragnarok and Endgame is incredible. And actually, you know. I, I think that Ragnarok, Infinity War, and Endgame are a better Thor trilogy than the actual Thor trilogy. Um, nothing against Thor one; Thor one's great, but yeah, that what uh, what Taika Waititi did and the Russo brothers did to really finally put Thor front and center for audiences in a way that we hadn't seen him yet was was just a delight for for me, who has who would really loved Thor from the beginning, but like definitely felt like. You know, Joss Whedon couldn't figure out what to do with him. And again, the dark world is a thing that happened. Um, or did it? Are we sure it happened? It, it happened. I like to think of... <laughs> we'll get to that when we come to stumbling blocks. I'll just say right now, I like to think of <laughs> Thor the Dark World, if it were called Loki the movie, I think would have been received so much better um, because that's all people want to watch that movie for anyways. Um, Oh wait, wait what? Josh, Josh Whedon? I I don't I like. Thought, I, don't, I thought Brana introduced. Thor. Yeah, but I I think Brana did a great job introducing Thor. So but do like, I. Yeah. I, I I feel like um, of all the characters in the first Avengers, Thor was kind of wasted, and he was definitely ah. utilized incorrectly in Age of Ultron. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that's not just Josh Whedon. That's also that is the most obviously obvious instance of studio meddling in the series that that film is it's it's fun it's a fun film but uh you know it would have been so much better if if the producer had just stayed out of it um again stumbling blocks we'll get to that later um what are your favorite moments in the series 
When Kath lifts the hammer in Endgame. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> I mean, it was foreshadowed throughout the entire series, especially in Ultron, when they're all trying to lift the hammer and it wiggles when and Steve and Thor's yeah. all like... But when he lifts that hammer in Endgame, like, the entire theater, like, roared yeah. with cheer. And I was like, yes! That's mine. <laughs> my, my theater didn't. It was sad. Oh, really? And I saw it opening day. It was me, <laughs> me, my sister, and the guy sitting to my right were the only three people who cheered on opening day when Steve Dude. picks up the hammer and it's like, why, why, why are you all here opening day? Why are you not excited you should, you about this? You should have stood up and been like, what is wrong with uh, you people? Yeah. Um, I, got, day, I got two more. I got a horrible one, but it's also a favorite because it was so impactful. It's the soft open of Hawkeye losing his family. The opening of it. Oh. Just the set up and you, it's like you, you know something horrible, you know what's probably going to happen and just the moan in silence when it happened by everybody in the theater was so powerful. Again, that's why we need the theater. We need that space, we need that communal experience together because we're all in this, all the, all the fans together. And then also in Infinity War, the she's not alone moment, which is a smaller moment than it is in Endgame when all the ladies get together to kick some ass. But I felt like it was just more powerful somehow because they didn't see it coming at that point. So it's when Wanda's slapped by, is it Pro Proxima? Yeah. Night. Yeah, and Black Widow. And Okoye are there and they just, yeah, they just kick some ass. And that was, that's a great moment. I, I think there are too few times that the women get that, that kind of moment. So I feel like it was built in Endgame for that reason. Um, but in uh, Infinity, it was just a nice beat. It just felt like it was a natural beat to happen. And I loved it. I just want to say, since we're talking about Okoye, I was a little disappointed in Endgame that she was so prominently featured on posters and in trailers and then didn't do much. Same with Wong. I'm, I, I don't even yeah. want to talk about Wong. <laughs> he, um, he's almost as powerful as Strange and he did nothing during Endgame. But he survived the snap. Yeah. So do you think that means they're going to have more to do? Coming up? I hope so. Yeah. He like, better. we have to tie this up with these guys over here, but then they're going to get their time and their moment. It's coming. Also, it's just a lot of people on screen to keep track of. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of people to make sure everybody's given equal time. Uh, so my favorite moments, um, the, the first one that comes to mind, and again, total bias, uh, is the strange Thanos one-on-one -on -one fight in Infinity War. Um, like, you know, there's some pretty cool stuff that goes on in the first Doctor Strange movie, but like just that fight, that, you know, roughly maybe 90 seconds of screen time really is a preview of what I'm hoping to see in Doctor Strange 2 when we just get to finally see him go all out with some really, really trippy magic. Um also, yeah, the hammer in Endgame, even though, <laughs> even though no one cheered in my theater. Um, but also, uh, also just when, uh, in, you know, right after that, on your left, and all of a sudden, yeah. every, we're just talking about it, everyone shows up. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a wonderful moment, and it's been, like, people have made so many different movies on it on YouTube. <laughs> like adding so many more characters outside of Marvel. Um, but, oh my gosh, like, what's, what is it Wong says? Like, you wanted more? Yeah. Like, it's, <laughs> to me, uh, it, 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 beat out, it beats out what was the most, the most epic entrance ever before that was at the end of Return of the King when Theoden shows up with the armies of, uh, of Rohan. And back then it was like, oh my gosh, um, but this was just, I, this was even better just because it was characters that we've come to know over, you know, years, uh, seeing like, and I, I don't know, I don't know why, but 
Black Panther being the first one to show up, it was it was absolutely the right move. Um, it feels right. Um, I'll, I'll get to why later. I think because uh, I think there's, there might be a good reason for that. Um, yeah, um, I think I think Endgame just has the best moments, even though it's not my favorite movie. Um, just yeah. Fun fact: When it cut to Peter Parker showing up at Endgame, I led the cheering in my theater. <laughs> <laughs> they showed they showed him and he did his little thing and this little mask came up and I went ah! and everyone else around me started clapping and I was like you're welcome <laughs> oh okay that's actually a good th- that leads me to this question which is completely off topic what is the most embarrassing like thing you've done in a in a in the theater at one of these movies like where you kind of ac- accidentally drew attention to yourself that wasn't an accident <laughs> oh, well well I mean you drew attention to yourself um. Daya, have you ever like, like like cheered at a random thing and then just realized you were like the only one cheering or just got the crowd riled up or something? No. See, that wasn't embarrassing to me. That's why. <laughs> but I do participate. Like I don't care if they're not in on it. I'm I'm in on it. I'm in surround. I'm there. I'm in the world. Like either join me or don't. I don't care. <laughs> uh, well, I have a my... feeling Ben has a story. <laughs> I have I have two. <laughs> Uh, one goes all the way back to uh, goes all the way back to Iron Man two, um, not my favorite movie by a long shot, um, but it has one. It had one of my first favorite stingers when Coulson shows up in the desert at the end, and they slowly pan down, and there's Mjolnir, and you have the thunder crack, and uh, I was in a huge theater then, and I literally screamed Thor. <laughs> Um, and I, I think I was the only person in the theater who knew what was going on. <laughs> Quite possibly, yeah. Um, and then the next one would be during Winter Soldier when, uh, when they're interrogating Agent Sitwell on the rooftop and he name drops Doctor Strange. I just, I literally squealed in the theater. It was so, like, <laughs> um, And then realized, oh, no one else is, is excited? Okay, fine. <laughs> This is great news for me. (laughs) Um, Speaking of stingers, that's that's the next topic I have here. How has the stinger, these mid or post credit scenes, changed how we set our expectations for future films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? I mean, uh, this wasn't really a thing in movies until uh, until superhero movies came along. Um, I think X Men Three, back in two thousand six, was the first movie to do this where they showed a uh, spoiler alert for a 14 year old x-men movie here um where you find out the professor x isn't dead oh my gosh right um but uh like how, like what so i'll, I'll just skip sort of to the next question and include that in there. Do you prefer, do you prefer a stinger that sets up the next movie or do you like the ones that set up something big down the road? Like, like they do in the first Iron Man. Well, I like, I like the ones where they have the two credits. They have the, the mid credit scene and the post credit scene where the mid credit scene um, teases the next thing. And I, I like the ones where it's the minuscule things, like not necessarily Thanos being like, fine, I'll do it myself when he puts the glove on. Like the, the bigger ones. I like those too, but I like personally the ones where it's just like the next superhero we're going to see. Um, and then the post credit scene is like the best end credit scene for me, honestly, is the shawarma scene at the end of Avengers. Um, because... <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with the story except Tony Stark said he wanted to try shawarma. But um, so like the, po- the mid credit scene where they, they tease the next little one and then the end credit scene where it's just kind of like a fun little segue. And that's, I, I mean, I mean, and then I, 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 sorry, the end of Iron Man 3 when he's talking to Bruce and Bruce is falling asleep the whole time. I like that one too. <laughs> I like that they're there. I usually don't know what they're referencing, but it always makes for fun talking post movie because they usually go with somebody who has theories by the time we get out the door so that's always fun I also like that they're reserving them for the end if nothing else than to make people sit there and watch the stream of 
names. I think there are so many thousands of people that contribute to these films that nobody knows the name of. And even if you're talking, if you happen to look up and glance every once in a while, that's a lot of talent up on that screen that you never actually see, but, you know, internal parts of this, these film series. So I appreciate that they do that and hold them for the end to make people be present and um, look at the screen every once in a while. Yeah, I mean, none of those movies can happen without those people, so. No, and it's massive names of people. I mean, they're going so fast, you can't possibly read to catch up. It's insane, and units and, you know, 11 different countries working simultaneously. And you'd have to, to turn them out as fast as they do. So huge amounts of, of artisans working on these things. And I really appreciate that they do that. Since we're on the topic of the shawarma scene, um, I'm sure everyone here knows the story behind that. But for those who don't, it's really, it's, it's really just a fun little bit. Um, so they didn't film that until a couple of weeks before Avengers came out. And by that time, Chris Evans was filming another movie and he had an incredible beard going on and he wasn't allowed to shave it. And that is why in that scene, Cap um, is sort of resting. Yep, just like that. He's, he's, it's literally just Chris Evans covering up his beard. He did a good job. I didn't even notice. Yeah. My favorite is Thor. He's just... That giant... Like that... <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I'm Yeah, good good on Hemsworth for really committing to the bit. Well, I mean, he's Australian. They like to eat down there, so it's probably it. <laughs> <laughs> uh what's it? I think it's Guardians Volume 2 has like four or five stingers in it, which is nuts. I think I think James Gunn and James Gunn like let people know before it came out. I think he just did that to uh to really <laughs> to really mess with people. Because uh, it's like obvious. It's obvious that some of them are just like, just dumb jokes. Um, I like I like David Hasselhoff in the credits. Yes, great <laughs> addition to the credits. Um, and Jeff Goldblum's in the credits too. I love that that they're teasing Ragnarok in there. Um, I was really excited when they teased uh, Adam Warlock in Guardians Two, because I thought, oh man, he's going to show up for Infinity War Endgame. Because in the comic books, he has one of the. Uh, the infinity gems and then he didn't and was like oh cool so we're just gonna wait for <laughs> guardians 3 now and see who who ends up playing adam warlock one of the most powerful powerful beings in the galaxy wasn't, it, be wasn't interesting. it rumored at first to be nathan fillion i don't remember that rumor um i'd heard rumors that nathan fillion was being looked at for nova oh yeah that's the one yeah i'm sorry um, you're right his Nathan Fillion was doing some sort of Marvel thing, and I didn't remember if it was that or if it was something else. I mean, I'm sure he'll show up in Guardians 3. He's already shown up in the first two in two Blink of you and You'll Miss It cameos. Wait, wait, who is he in, in the second one? Um, in the scenes on Earth where everyone's, like, running away from the... Uh, the Dairy Queen? Can, like, yeah, from the Dairy Queen. Like, they're driving by a movie theater, and he is on the poster of oh, the movie cool. theater. <laughs> Good. <laughs> He would be, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, one hundred percent chance Nathan Fillion and it's James Gunn, they're best buds. So it's it's gonna happen. I, love it. I would love that. <laughs> um. So yeah, oh stingers! Thank you, thank you, Marvel, for giving us stingers. Um. Really, it's it's a shame that only eight big franchises can do stingers, but you know they're fun. They're always fun. You never know what to expect. Um, oh, here we go. Here's a fun question. Uh, what what year do you consider the most pivotal year in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Like the year that had maybe the best combination of films and the most important films. Uh, what was that game-changing year for them, in your opinion? For me, it's 2014 for Winter Soldier and Guardians. But my second is 2017 for Volume 2, Homecoming, and Ragnarok. I think, um, honestly, 2009, 2008, whenever Iron Man came out in 2012, because um, it set up the whole thing. Um, but my favorite is pretty much everything in phase three. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, Dea, you and I are 100% in agreement. For me, 2014 um, is 
like Winter Soldier changed everything for the superheroes yeah. on Earth. It really set them down the path to civil war. Um, they, they set up so much in Winter Soldier that was so important with everything on Earth. And then again, Guardians, like <laughs> Guard, Guardians changed so much. It, and really, really with them, it's just the beginning. We've, we haven't seen that much of, you know, the, the space opera side of Marvel. There's so much that can be done. Um, you know, we're probably going to get Galactus at some point and not, not stupid Fantastic Four 2007, was it 2007? Galactus, the cloud, the cloud monster. No, we want, I want, am I the only one here who saw Rise of the Silver Surfer? No, I just blocked it out of my mind. Good call. Um, <laughs> it, well, I think, well, never mind. <laughs> all, all, all anyone needs to know about that movie regarding Galactus is that Galactus is a cloud monster and not a giant, amazing being that eats planets, which would be so much cooler. Um, it's 2014 for me. Um, 2017 was a good year. I think 2018. No, no. 2019 might be my second favorite just because just the sheer quality of those of like Captain Marvel and game and far from home. Like those are three of the best consecutive films in the series. Um, you know, I want, I want to say, I want to put Dr. Strange in there somewhere in best consecutive films in the series, but Dr. Strange is bordered by, what came after Dr. Strange? Gar oh, Guardians 2. And Guardians, again, Guardians 2 is good, but it's not one of my favorites. Um, oh, here we go. We've been, we've been dancing around this a lot tonight. What do you say are some of the franchise's stumbling blocks? I mean, we already know the answer, but Thor The Dark World is one of them. Oh, yeah. Um, Iron Man 2. Um, what's another one that I don't like that much? Uh, I don't, I don't hate all Age of Ultron. Um, it's not the best and it's the worst Avengers movie, but as a movie in the MCU, I don't think it's that bad. I think it's just okay, but I don't, I mean, it came after Avengers and it, in the Avengers, of the Avengers movies, it is by far the worst one but I just think it, it could have been better in my opinion, but I think Thor the Dark World takes the cake for me. I registered that question is different than this intent. I was thinking of it as uh, what are difficulties it's facing outside of, outside of just the movies that they've done. Oh. Um, I think building more equality into the women's sector is, is something that they've struggled with for a long ass time. It was, you know, I mean, even Joss put in um, a woman who doesn't even exist to get some more females in there. So um, I think that's going to be interesting to see how they're going to equal that out. And then also how they're going to invest in this new wave after the old vanguard change out um, to see if they can garner as much interest and support uh, from the new leaders here. That's, yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting take on that question, Dea. Thank you. And I actually, I have a response for both that problem of equality as well as the problem of Age of Ultron. And that has a lot to do with studio interference, particularly from a man named Ike Perlmutter, who- I have seen his name in Dea's credits. <laughs> <laughs> he is uh <laughs> yeah he was in charge he was in charge of marvel entertainment which marvel studios fell under for several years um and he, i have heard stories of just he would he would do things like uh he would just provide uh catering with nothing like there would be sandwiches and soda pop like there'd be nothing for the actors to eat um and they would just go over to like to the lot, another studio, another film's lot and ask them for food. Um, he did not, uh, he did not think that Black Widow action figures would sell because he thought that no one was interested in the female characters. I he do remember want, that one. I do remember hearing about that one. He didn't want them to make Black Panther. Um, he's yeah. Um, so Kevin Feige, you know, the big, the big producer over at Marvel, yeah. um, 
was finally just, he was so fed up, he threatened to quit. And this was around the time of Ultron. Um, and it was after that point where Disney finally said, we're going to take Marvel Studios and we're going to put them under our umbrella. Feige is in charge of everything and Perlmutter gets television. So that's when you finally get to see amazing things like Black Panther showing up in Civil War. Mm-hmm. You start seeing Captain Marvel. They're starting to develop a you know, Black Widow movie. And it's like, finally, finally we get out from you know under this just generally awful person um and Perlmutter is actually also the person who wanted them to make the Inhumans movie and I think it's probably because he departed and went to Marvel television that Inhumans became a tv show um and we'll get to tv in a bit um but yeah he was a major stumbling block and uh and also yes Thor the Dark World was definitely I don't know I don't know why it is that um, that Patty Jenkins wanted to quit. I know that uh, she spe- Patty Jenkins specifically signed on to do Dark World because Natalie Portman wanted her to. Portman mm-hmm. wanted more women directors to be working on these films. And you know the fact that Patty Jenkins left the film is one of the reasons that Natalie Portman decided not to come back for Ragnarok. Um, thankfully, um, she's back for Love and Thunder. And I, I think, a, I believe a part of that is because she really appreciates Taika Waititi as a director. I think I think we all do. I think we all want to work with him. Well, I, I heard that pretty much everybody had a miserable time with the director of Throw the Dark World. I don't even remember who directed it, forgive me. But um, I just, I heard he was a nightmare to work with, especially with Natalie Portman and Christopher Eccleston. His name is Alan Taylor. And the only thing I really know of his, um, he directed uh, several episodes of Game of Thrones. Was it the last season? <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> um, he, his, I think his Thrones credits were before he did Dark World. So it's probably stuff in season one and two. Oh, okay. um, but I think they, I think Marvel like pulled him in because of his experience on big budget HBO shows. And they, I think they kind of wanted to give the Dark World a Game of Thrones feel and it didn't really pan out. They had a Game of Thrones season eight feel. That's for sure. <laughs> Yikes. Um, <laughs> Iron Man 2 is to me it also, yeah, I agree, it's a stumbling block. Um, it's not bad, but I feel like they definitely rushed it after the success of the first film before they really had a plan. Um, think, and yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think it's just kind of awkwardly placed in, in the order. Because it, it got solo movie, Incredible Hulk, and then sequel to the first one. And it's just kind of awkwardly placed in there. I don't know, I would have put it like later on and maybe given it more time, but yeah, yeah. Um, also, Incredible Hulk, I think, is a stumbling block. And I think that's because I don't think it was a movie that was intended to be part of the MCU originally. Right. I don't know if that movie knows what it wants to be because it definitely feels like it could be a sequel to Ang Lee's Hulk. It feels like it takes a lot of inspiration from the TV show. Um, you know, really all that ties it to the MCU is the fact that they have um, some Stark equipment in there um, given Martin, to Ross. Martin Starr, Martin Starr is the um, yes. IT guy and he's the teacher in Spider-Man Homecoming. Yep, that was a, that's a wonderful bit of retconning. I think, on honestly, I think it's a huge coincidence, but it totally works. It totally works in the universe, yep. so. <laughs> um, and I'll, we'll get to the problem of the problems with the, the Hulk as a character and just as a, as a, as a, as a character they can't really work with in solo movies anymore in a bit. Um, so yeah, you know, MCU, wonderful, wonderful series. Definitely not without its problems though. But I think a lot of people are okay to overlook most of them because there's so much good that we yeah. get to deal with too. For, for every bad, there's like 800 good. So mm-hmm. yes. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, what what doors have they left open? You know, what there's lots of plot points that remain unresolved, particularly in The Incredible Hulk. Um, what happened to Betty? What happened to Betty Ross? Yeah. <laughs> That's mine. Where is she? Uh, Daya, did you ever see The Incredible Hulk? Is that the Edward Norton? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a million years ago when it first came out. Like, I have seen it since. That's... So that's recall how that one was taken. I believe that is the case with most fans. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, Betty Ross just sort of disappears. Um, it was always weird to me in Age of Ultron when they tried to make Bruce and Nat a thing, and I was like, "He's got a thing." Like, yeah, he's, he's already got he's already got a girlfriend out there in the. I universe. mean, and General General Ross continues throughout. I mean, he's not General anymore, but yeah, his, say uh, William Hurt appears throughout the thing. So, where's his daughter? Does he doesn't even mention her? She's his daughter. Yeah. Uh, which, <laughs> Which actually I think was a brilliant idea to bring him into Civil War um, and kind of remind the world that The Incredible Hulk is still a movie that exists. <laughs> um, because yeah, it, it's, it is, it's easily forgotten um, because, because it doesn't feel like a film that ties in to the rest of the series very well because of, again, we'll get to the weirdness of Hulk. But like they also set up, um, they also set up Dr. Samuel Stearns at the end of The Incredible Hulk. And it's like, you have a villain waiting in the wings um, that has, it's been 12 years. Where, where, has he just been like hanging out on the raft? He's, he's with Betty. That's where, he, that's where he is. Oh, that's, <laughs> here we go. All the Incredible Hulk characters that we thought should come back <laughs> are all just hanging out in one room together. <laughs> like literally just in the room like, okay. Uh. Yeah. Um, I guess I didn't realize that it was part of this because of the recasting. I guess they thought we're now in a reboot much like Spider-Man because everything past belongs to Sony. So in my brain, it like didn't belong in here anyway. That's a good point too. I don't too. think you're the only one. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I, I, you know, and I, I feel ridiculous for thinking this back then, but back in, you know, 2010, 2011, whenever it was that they said Mark Ruffalo was going to be Hulk. Now I was, I was literally like, really? I don't think this is going to work. And of course, you know, it's beautiful. I'm, hap- I'm happy him. to be wrong. I yeah. love him. He does so much with so little, and I mean that in the best of ways. Yeah. Um, I um, really want to see WandaVision. I want, I want to tap into that relationship. I don't know anything about either one of them outside of what the movies have shown, and I love their chemistry, and I love their character work, and I want to see it. Oh, Wanda has gone through some incredible retconning in the comic books over the years. Um, like depending on what, depending on what book you're reading, you know, Wanda is actually Wanda and Quicksilver are the children of Magneto in the comic oh, books. The um, and they've since, I think, I think at this point they've been retconned in the comic books to where they're not his children and they're no longer considered mutants. And I believe that is actually due to the success of the films and they want to, you know, try and make the comics more like the films now, which is a little bit of a shame. Um, any other any other plot points though that are unresolved? The Hulk is probably the biggest one. Um, I want to know. I want to know what happened to Justin Hammer in Iron Man Two, though. Yeah, um, he's in the. Uh, he makes a brief cameo in the. Uh, it's the one shot on. Shoot, it's I can't remember which which one it comes with. Um does everyone here know about the one shots? Yeah, I know the Peggy one. There's the Peggy one, there's the one where Colson goes to the desert on his on, I think it's called the funny thing happened on the way to Thor's hammer. Um <laughs> but they did one where I'm, in, someone, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what a one shot is. I'm sorry. Okay, um so on on the DVDs and Blu-rays um of a couple of the films, um there are these like these 10 to 15 minute short films that sort of fill in some of some, either some plot holes or just they spin off into something new. The one on the Avengers is uh, about like two criminals who come across the, uh, the tech um, that's been left behind in New York and they're captured by shield. And that was supposed to be like sort of the pilot pilots, weird type of thing for agents of shield. Um, And they did one for agent Carter. Um, They gave, they gave not Betty, they, they, they gave her, um, uh, Peggy. Peggy, thank you. <laughs> yes. I, I trust you to know everything about Peggy Carter. <laughs> um, they gave Peggy a one shot and that spun off into the TV show. Um, they did one where they just do a funny little story about what happens to Phil Coulson on his way to New Mexico to find Mjolnir. Like he saves some people in a, in a holdup at a, like at a quick stop. Um, and uh, there's one, I can't remember which movie it's on, 
but uh, someone goes in to interview. Uh, it's Trevor, right? The guy who is the Mandarin but isn't Trevor. Trevor yeah. Slattery. Yeah, he goes uh, to interview- Ben Kingsley, right? Yeah, Ben Kingsley's character. Uh, a reporter goes to interview him in prison, and Justin Hammer is there and just has a brief cameo and makes some sort of snide remark. Um, but uh, that one actually sets up the fact that there's a real Mandarin out there. Um, like, they actually kidnap Ben Kingsley and take him away, and he's like, we're going to introduce you to the real Mandarin. I was like, oh, oh this wow. is great. This is really cool. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. I, lo- I love that. That's, that, that's wonderful. <laughs> ole, ole, ole. Um, <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna see the Mandarin finally in the Shang Chi movie. Um, so that's that's a big plot point that's been unresolved and been set up since the original Iron Man with the Ten Rings. So finally, now now that now that Tony Stark is no longer a part of these films, they're finally going to introduce his actual comic book nemesis. Oh, good. Yeah, good planning. <laughs> good planning on that part. So yeah, uh, those are those are actually two pretty yeah. Those are some pretty unresolved things that have happened. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's unresolved stuff that we know is going to get fixed. Like, like the Sinister Six? I'm really... I, we'll talk about Spider-Man in a bit. Because <laughs> that whole thing, just with how long, how much longer he Tom Holland has in the series and then goes back to Sony, is it scares me. I'm glad, I'm glad he gets two more films. But oh, <laughs> man. Oh. Wait, the rights oh. revert back? Well, Sony still has the rights. Um, Marvel just has the option to use him in one more solo film and then as a character in any other one film. But then he has to go back and do stuff exclusively for Sony. Yeah, but he, it's, it's oh. been confirmed that there's going to be a third Spider-Man movie. Yes. It's confirmed. There is Don't a third Spider-Man. Now, yeah. but there would be so, the MCU. Yeah. Yes. So. Okay. But Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that. This is such, it is a very complicated problem along with the Hulk problem. Yeah, and then also aren't X-Men technically Marvel, but not? And Fantastic uh, They Four. are, they are now. Yeah, okay. Every, it's everybody except for Hulk. Uh, well, Hulk, yes. Again, we'll get to this in a bit. Spider-Man <laughs> and, Spider-Man and any character that's sort of related to Spider-Man um, is still at Sony. Okay. That's how we got, that's why we had Venom. Uh, Are we going to talk about Venom or we're not going to talk about Venom? We can talk about, we can talk I, about Venom. I mean, I don't want to, but I didn't know if that was on the schedule. Oh. Um, it'll probably come up in the Spider-Man problem. Okay. Um, so that is going to be the end of the first half of the Marvel Cinematic Universe episode. It actually ended up running so long that we decided to call in Thanos to snap away half of the footage so that we could bring you a nice, succinct, hour-and-a-half-long episode. Uh, but rest assured, we are currently in the middle of a time heist to recover the missing footage. And once we have the six Infinity Stones, I can assure you that that one outcome out of 14,605,000 will be the one in which the footage is recovered. So stay tuned.